The Great Depression was one of the most widespread economic disasters that the world has ever seen. In its wake, it left businesses in ruin, it left families destroyed, and entire economies were left in tatters. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, we're going to hear from a handful of historians as they discuss the global impact of the Great Depression. We begin now with the story about the Great Depression's impact on currency, both in the States as well as abroad. Enjoy. In at least one way, the Great Depression was among the most transformative chapters of the 20th century. That's a big statement in a century that saw two world wars. I'm not saying the Depression was necessarily the most important. Among the changes it catalyzed, though, was to transform the role of the federal government in the U.S. economy. Even Americans born to freedom and steeped in limited government with a yellow flag bearing the slogan, don't tread on me, accepted vastly more government intervention in their lives. The fallout moved well beyond the United States. If the Great Depression had never happened, we wouldn't have as many international economic institutions today as we do. If the economic environment around the world hadn't been so horrible, people wouldn't have clamored for immediate solutions. They wouldn't have accepted some of the world's government's more extreme attempts to find a remedy. But in times of crisis, like during wars, people give their leaders more discretion. War puts the nation's survival at risk. Aside from massive outbreaks of disease, like the Black Death in the 14th century, the Great Depression was the closest thing to war you'll find. Economic misery often leads to bad government policies and bad voter decisions. Take the example of Italy after World War I. Even before the war, Italy was no economic powerhouse. Despite being on the winning side, it had suffered serious losses. The Italian government wasn't quite broke, but inflation had taken hold. By 1920, its economy suffered from strikes, high unemployment, and even food shortages. In 1922, the fascist government of Benito Mussolini gained power. Germany fared even worse. With its industry and population in ruins after World War I and crushed by the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, the Weimar Republic funded government by turning to the printing press. Inflation was the inevitable result. No one was prepared for the inflation of the early 1920s, though. In 1918, the U.S. dollar was worth 8.9 Reichsmarks. Five years later, by November, 20, November 1923, it took 4.2 trillion Reichsmarks to equal a single greenback. In other words, the German mark was now worthless. Under these conditions, it could no longer be used for even routine transactions, and Germans were forced to rely on barter as a way to buy and sell goods. So the German government demonetized the mark and issued new Renten marks that were to be exchanged one to one trillion of the old marks. At this point, the United States facing default of its foreign loans, stepped in and began loaning new money to Germany and encouraging U.S. companies to invest in its erstwhile enemy. By getting the other allies to agree on a realignment of the reparations payment schedule, the United States also began to guarantee German war reparations. The specter of inflation was not confined to Germany. The Austrian crown had been trading at 5 to 1 U.S. dollar before the war. But by 1922, its rate of exchange was 83,600 crowns to the dollar. Industrialized nations wanted nothing more than a return to the state of normalcy. But this was a difficult proposition in the post-war political atmosphere, as the winners struggled to protect what they had gained in the war's aftermath and the losers were licking their wounds. Following World War I, the U.S. did what it always did after a war. It shrank its army down to a tiny force, 100,000 or so. 
The extent of U.S. isolationism during this period shouldn't be exaggerated. The American economy was enormous, and so almost by definition, it was not and could not be isolated from the rest of the world. Indeed, when the global economy bounced back from the First World War in the 1920s, it was the doing of American bankers and financial officials. However, the war and the tough terms imposed on Germany under the Versailles Treaty set up a badly unbalanced world economic system. Even if Americans had wanted their country to play a major international role, which they didn't, the possibilities for doing so changed radically at the end of the 1920s. At the end of October 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed. Now, the crash itself isn't what caused the Great Depression that followed. Instead, there were lots of long-term structural problems in the U.S. economy. But the market crash popped a speculative bubble, and that had a whole series of spillover effects in other sectors of the economy. Paper losses in financial assets soon led to bank failures and a liquidity crisis in the rest of the economy. With that, the United States and world markets plunged into general misery. Remember, the European economy depended on U.S. money flowing in. Once that flow stopped after 1929, the resulting depression brought Hitler to power. Widespread misery in the United States had deep political consequences. Poverty and even near starvation were widespread, and unemployment approached a third of the workforce. To make matters worse, the existing political system seemed to be able to do little to fix the problem. Prevailing economic orthodoxy was to tighten up fiscal policy in a crisis, cut spending, balance budgets, and wait for things to turn around. But it didn't happen. U.S. President Herbert Hoover, although a successful businessman, seemed out of his depth. Many people ended up in tent cities called Hoovervilles, living on handouts from soup kitchens. Meanwhile, Farmers in the Great Plains of Oklahoma and Kansas and large areas of Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado suffered widespread and devastating crop failures due to a series of severe droughts. It was the time of the Dust Bowl, as chronicled in John Steinbeck's novel The Grapes of Wrath and the music of Woody Guthrie. During the Great Depression, the American people lost confidence that their individual states could do anything to solve these massive economic problems. So the American people turned to the federal government for a solution, and in particular to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who ran for president in 1932 on the promise of a New Deal. FDR entered the White House in March 1933, and together with his so-called brain trust of advisors, devised an ambitious plan to revive the American economy through a combination of new federal jobs programs, like the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, and the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, and new federal regulations of both the financial system and private business enterprises. During the first 100 days of FDR's administration, Congress enacted a number of new federal laws to implement this ambitious plan. But FDR soon ran into big trouble with the Supreme Court. One problem was that many of FDR's new federal regulations and programs impacted not only interstate and foreign commerce, but also commercial activities that were conducted completely within a particular state. In other words, intrastate commerce. And the Commerce Clause in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gave the federal government no enumerated power to regulate such purely intrastate commerce. So, in a series of decisions, the Supreme Court held that many of the new federal statutes enacted by Congress, pursuant to FDR's plan, were unconstitutional, often due to the limited scope of the Commerce Clause. Among the statutes held unconstitutional were the National Industrial Recovery Act, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the Bituminous Coal Conservation Act, and the Municipal Bankruptcy Act. 
It was not until the mid to late 1930s, during the height of the Great Depression, that the tides of federalism began to change. Frustrated by a Supreme Court that continued to block his New Deal programs, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt threatened to expand the Supreme Court. He wanted to appoint justices who were more sympathetic to his interpretation of interstate commerce and who would be inclined to see the federal government as expansive and as powerful as he did. Ultimately, in a 1937 case involving the National Labor Relations Board and Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation, the Supreme Court decided that the federal government could regulate working conditions, mandate minimum wages, and protect the rights of workers to organize. Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation argued that its right to control its workers' conditions were local matters out of the reach of the federal government. But the court held that as large corporations with connections across many states, Congress had the constitutional authority to regulate the company as provided by the Commerce Clause in Article I, Section 8. This case was the beginning of a sea change in the way the judicial branch interpreted the Commerce Clause and protected the role of federal government in regulating all sorts of matters of people's lives. The federal government greatly expanded in power and scope during the 20th century, and the balance of federalism power shifted with it. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch all the full series now on Wondrium.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Turn on notifications and you'll get an alert every time we post a new episode of Perspectives.